Welcome to the Clear the Shelf podcast with Chris and Chris, the show that meets at the intersection of education and entertainment to discuss online arbitrage, retail arbitrage, wholesale, and all facets of selling on Amazon. We'll bring you news, tactics, strategies, insights, stories, and interviews to help you grow your Amazon business. And now, here are your hosts, Chris Grant and Chris Rasick. What's up, Amazon sellers, and welcome back to the Clear the Shelf podcast with myself and my sesquipedalian co-host, Chris Racing. Uh, Today, we have a very special guest, Chris Potter. Uh, He's a former multi-million dollar Amazon seller. He's the owner of 43 tax offices in multiple states, the co-founder of Tall Oak Advisors, and the tallest former Amazon seller that I've ever met in person. And we're going to be chatting about bookkeeping and tax planning today. I know that it's not the sexiest of topics, but it's one that'll keep you out of club fed and hopefully allow you to keep as much of your profits in your pocket and out of Uncle Sam's. Now, before we dive in, you know the drill. This show isn't free. We don't charge you any money, but if you can take a moment and give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast player or smash the thumbs up on the on the YouTube channel, It helps us a ton and it gets us back into the lab to create more of these shows for you. So Chris, I appreciate you taking the time to be with us, man. We've got a, we've got a trio of Chris's today. So hopefully none of us will get confused, but I always like to kind of set the table a bit. And so for those who may not know you, can you give us a a bit of a background about your entrepreneurial journey and what took you from a seller of products to a tax savant? Tax savant. I I like that. So. Yeah, and I actually started selling on eBay way back in the day. I'm, a, I'm like an old relic at this point. 2005 is actually when I started selling on eBay. I transitioned fully to full-time Amazon in 2008. So it's a very, very old relic. And I went full-time at that point, built up, built up multiple millions of dollars of sales over multiple years. Uh, I actually had a costume business that within Amazon that ended up collapsing in 2013. We were at about three and a half million in sales at that point. We collapsed because of really heavy debt, which is another story for another day. And then after that, I came back from the ashes and started up another Amazon business in 2014. And that business, we went through different iterations. We were doing arbitrage. We were doing wholesale. We did some private label. We did some drop shipping. And at our peak, we did about $13 million in sales. And in 2020, exited out of those businesses and decided to buy tax offices. Pretty interesting transition, but I acquired a pretty large operation from two different sellers in their franchise business. And that's what I've been operating for the last three years now. So we bought those in 2020. We're getting ready to go up, leave into our now fourth tax season together with me at the helm. I have, uh, I have a big team now, about 80 something people that work in the franchise offices during tax season. And now with our tall look advisors, we launched that about a year and a half ago now. And that's specifically geared towards e-commerce, uh, bookkeeping and taxes. And we have a specific team now dedicated to just e-commerce. That's fantastic. And I know you're the co-founder of tall look advisors. The other co-founder being, I believe someone we might all know as well. Correct. Yeah. Ryan Apel is yeah. actually a partner in. Uh, this particular business, he's also a partner in our North Carolina portion of our franchise business as well. Nice. Awesome. Uh, he's, he's someone that I need to have on the podcast. He's, he's an incredible seller. Yeah. So I want to, I want to start this off with what I think may be a, a little bit of a tough question. At least it's one that I know I find difficult to properly explain. And, and probably that means that I don't properly understand it. But what is a, what is a cash conversion cycle and why is it important for Amazon sellers to understand that? Hey guys, wanted to take a quick second and thank you for listening to the Clear the Shelf podcast. My magnanimous co-host Chris Rasick has put together a gift for you for being a listener. It's called the Monthly Goal Tracking Spreadsheet and it's free. The spreadsheet will help you break down and track how much you've purchased, which should be a leading indicator of how much you will sell. And then you'll be able to track how much you've sold as well as your estimated monthly profit on a daily basis. This will all feed into the daily averages so you can ensure that you're on track to meet your goals each and every month. Grab it for free today over at cleartheshelf.com forward slash goal dash tracking. Thanks again for being a listener. Now back to the show. 
It's a very good question. And I would say that it's probably more important for probably private label sellers than it is for arbitrage sellers and wholesale sellers, mm -hmm. but still important for any inventory based business. And it can be somewhat misleading in, in, in various reasoning, but I'll kind of explain to you what it kind of means and how you can utilize it in your business and why it's impactful. The general gist of it is the cash conversion cycle effectively tells you how many days of cash that you need within your business to be able to operate properly. That's the gist of it. Now, the technical calculation of it is basically the amount of days you have in inventory plus the days of time to receive payment. And you deduct out the money to actually pay the money off. So like in online arbitrage sense, the way that would look is it takes sometimes, let's say, for example, it takes you 60 days on average to sell your inventory once it hits the Amazon warehouse. Some people are significantly better than this, but let's just throw on the example, let's say 60 days. Then you have to think about these different lag periods that you have with all of this stuff. So you've got the lag period between when it basically goes from a prep center to the actual Amazon before it comes back to, let's just say it's seven days. Might be more than that, less, just throwing examples out there. Let's say seven days. And there's also a lag period between when your prep center receives it and it actually sends out to Amazon. Some prep centers are faster than others. Let's just say two days for this one. And there's also a lag period between when you place the order as not only an arbitrage seller and when on the credit card and they charge your credit card and when it's delivered to the prep center. Let's just say three days for this. So you add all these up, you know, it's 60 days sitting in the warehouse with Amazon, seven days lag period uh, staying in the to get it active in Amazon, two days at the prep center, three days to get it to the prep center, that's 72 days total. So now there's also a lag period between when it sells on Amazon and you actually receive the cash for it. We know there's reserve balances, there's all this stuff that goes into this. And so you kind of have to figure out what your average time frame is based on your reserve balances because every, every person is different on this. But let's just throw out their 10 days. Let's throw out their 10 days. So if we said there was 10 days for to receive your cash, 72 days for all the inventory to go on, that's a total of 82 days. Okay. Well, we have to deduct how much time you have a leeway on the payment. So you're putting everything on a credit card, that gives you some leeway. If you're doing net terms, that gives you leeway as well. So whatever that day, that day period is, you have to factor that out. Now let's say we're sticking with the OA reference, which is using credit cards for everything. Generally, your, your cycle is what, maybe 45 days is 30 days when you hit your, your first day of your statement. There are 30 days before you actually get your statement, then usually 15 days to pay it off. About 45 days. But on average, you're not putting everything the first day you start, you start, you start. You're going to buy stuff throughout the entire month. So you have to kind of assume that on average, maybe that cycle, maybe 20 to 25 days, somewhere around there. And let's just say 23 days just for the heck of it. So then what we do is we basically say 82 days minus 23 days equals 59 days. So effectively what that means is that in this various example we gave here, it means you need to have roughly about almost two months worth of cash to basically operate your business. And so to factor that out, you would say, all right, well, how much do I typically spend inventory, whatever dollar amount that is, and however much it takes you to actually operate your business in two month time span. You add that up, that's effectively how much cash you need to operate your business without running into some sort of problems. And we're talking about this, it's like how much credit do you have, how much cash you have on the end in, in your bank, but that's kind of like the way you have to look at it. So, you know, when we're working with clients, we give a, a very, we give this number out to a lot of our clients that we'll actually name it cash convergence cycle because like people don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, we just put average, you always know, put average days, uh, turn as tip wheel we do. And, you know, we basically give a number out for our clients and it's more or less just gives you an idea of how much cash you kind of need to operate. Uh, and what you would do is you would typically look at this over time and see how it changes. So like one month, it might be 59 days. Next month, it might be 60 days. Next month, it might drop down to 40 something days. And the reason why that would happen mostly is because you're either getting better terms on, on your, on your stuff that's going on, or you're doing much better at, uh, turning your inventory. So you're selling your inventory faster and that's how you kind of get that number down. But realistically, the whole goal here is to figure out how much money do you actually need to not run into trouble. And that's what the whole cash convergence cycle is. Hopefully that wasn't like totally ridiculous how I explained that, but that's the basic gist of it. No, that, that gives me, I know that gives me a lot better understanding. So I appreciate it. Hmm. Hmm. Got four. Chris, another, we haven't met in person. So I have a, another difficult question. Yep. How tall are you? Six, six. Very difficult. <laughs> All right. 
I I couldn't I I couldn't just let that dangle in the intro without without asking. So, well, good. But, uh, uh, um, in my in my mastermind, we have uh, a couple different structures of stores as far as like how they're set up. Mm-hmm. Not really sole proprietor. I I doubt there are, there are too many of those that are listening that are <laughs> looking at this in depth of a topic. But like I, I want to talk about what what makes sense as far as structuring your store. When when does an S corp? make sense over an LLC or can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, you know, realistically, like you said, the difference between S corp and LLC, let's look at it from a tax perspective. There actually is no difference between an S corp. I'm sorry, between an LLC and a sole proprietor. There's no difference tax wise. It's mostly liability wise. And so we do have a lot of clients that come to us when they're first starting out and they're just kind of selling out of the basement and they're just kind of, you know, doing stuff. And then they realize, oh crap, I can make some money on this. I'm actually turning this into a real business. And then they're like, oh man, they probably need an LLC. And so we see that the lot of they do that shift at some point. And from a tax perspective, it makes no difference. So I just want to make that clear for anyone that's listening today that if you're like, oh, I really need to get this taken care of right away, it's only for a liability aspect you need to worry about. From a tax perspective, it makes no difference. Now, when we're talking about moving over to an S Corp, we do get a lot of questions on this because some people get very confused. I was actually talking to a guy yesterday where he was working with another accountant and they told him to start out as an S corp pretty much immediately, which almost hmm. always is a terrible idea. And the reason being is that when you move over to an S corp, the goal here is, is that you should make, be making about 40 to $50,000 in profit is roughly about the mark when it makes sense to do it. The reason for this is yes, it does actually save you on taxes, but there's a lot of costs involved in moving over to an S corp. In particular, you now have to pay for a payroll service to start paying yourself payroll. Those services are not cheap. They're like 40 bucks a month. So you factor that in, that's all about 480 bucks a year you're paying just for a payroll service. And they're the ones that also do your filing quarterly for your taxes. Now, the other issue you run into is that your actual taxes, when you're doing a sole proprietor or an LLC, it just adds onto your personal return. So it's not a separate return. Well, as soon as you go over to an S Corp, it's now you're adding on a second tax return, which now means your accountant has to do a fully separate tax return, which costs more money. And so when you kind of add all this up, there's more complexity with this. And also in theory, you should have better bookkeeping at this point too. So you should theoretically be having someone actually doing your bookkeeping at this point, which means that just utilizing inventory labs, selling more, those sorts of tools as your only method of bookkeeping in the IRS's eyes, theoretically is not accurate. Now we've seen people do this, but theoretically from a perspective of, if you look at the guidelines, you're supposed to have adequate bookkeeping for it in inventory lab and the uh, seller board, just not adequate bookkeeping. So kind of sum things up here. Basically the number is about forty fifty thousand dollars when you really start saving money. And the way that works is it's basically splitting your profits because when you're an S, when you're actually a LLC or a sole proprietor, anytime you make money on, on your stuff, so let's say you make, you know, twenty thousand dollars, you're paying your standard taxes. So you're paying your your federal, you're paying your state. If you have state tax, I know Chris Grant doesn't have to make sure I say the right, Chris. Uh, but if you, if you don't have state taxes, that's cool. But then you still also have to pay a self-employment tax, which is roughly 15.3%. All, all of that $20,000. When you move over to an S corp, what's happening is you're basically splitting that money up in between salary and distributions to where like, let's say you take a $10,000 salary. Then that 15.3% is effectively replacing Medicare, Social Security, the stuff you would normally see on a W-2, like when you work in a regular job. And so you'd still get charged that stuff. But then the extra $10,000, you wouldn't get self-employment tax, which saves you $1,500 in taxes because of that. And so you have to figure out, like, what is the right number? There's also other varying things we do with this. Uh, there's something called a QBI deduction that, that changes things around. So there's various things you kind of have to think about for some of this stuff, which is when you talk to your your tax person this year. Those are all various things you can ask them about, but realistically, that's kind of the bulk of it is don't do it until you're about forty, fifty thousand dollars in profit. And that's pretty much the reason why. Is the, uh, and now is the S corp, are there profits taxed? Is there, is there double taxation come into play at all? Nope. nope. It's, uh-huh. a, it's actually kind of like when you're an LLC or a sole proprietor, which some people don't know this is that when you make, let's say the $20,000, it just gets taxed to you personally. And S Corp's exactly the same way it gets taxed to you personally. The difference is, is whether it gets taxed to you in like a payroll type setup where it's paying your payroll like a W-2 or if it's taxed as distribution. You're not getting taxed twice. It's just one specific flow through to go see you personally. That's typically how that works. 
is there is there any limit on how much in distributions you can take over I, I know you need to have a you need to have a regular payroll for yourself it can't be you can't pay yourself ten thousand dollars a year of course mm-hmm. uh but once you let know let's say you pay yourself sixty thousand dollars a year is there a limit on how much you can take in distributions over above that well, keep in mind when we're talking about taking distributions, even if you leave the money in the business, it's still considered taking a distribution. So that's something to keep in mind. That's a lot of people don't know, especially on like when on the LLC and sole proprietors, they think, well, the money's in inventory. I didn't take money out of the business, so I shouldn't be taxed. Not the way it works. So regardless of where you made it, where that money's sitting at, whether it's in your checking account, whether it's in inventory, doesn't matter. You're still taxed on it. So specifically, as far as like the difference between moving between uh, your question here, which is well, how much can I take out? It really depends on how much you're making total. And this kind of like got thrown into flux when they came out with a, a law change a few years ago with a QBI deduction, because a QBI deduction basically gives you a 20% write-off of the income that you make as long as you're not in a specialized service, which all Amazon sellers are not a specialized service. So you qualify for this. And there's a, there's limits here. So there's limits based on what your income levels are and like how much salary you take. And this is basically a calculation that your, that your accountant would typically do when they're doing your taxes to fig, help you figure out what these numbers should be. And if you're at higher income levels, the traditional thing has been saying, okay, well, if I make like, you know, let's say you made like $400,000, well, maybe my salary should only be like a hundred thousand. I want to save that extra 15%. But now with this QBI deduction, sometimes it actually makes more sense to make a larger payroll than it used to back in the day. And so that's again, it's calculations that your accountant can generally figure out to see what the best situation is. If you're like lower, if you're lower dollar amounts where you're like, let's say making 150,000, 100,000, that's mostly like, what would it actually cost to hire someone to replace you? In this industry, usually 60 to $80,000 is usually kind of sufficient enough, unless you're at a lower profit level where then you start to have to figure out, okay, well, you know, is it maybe 40% of your profits? Is it 30% of your profits? You kind of just figure it out with your account that what makes the most sense for you and what's defensible and you know, that sort of thing to the IRS. Perfect. Now, something you brought up there was adequate bookkeeping. Uh, mm-hmm. And so what are, the, what are the common accounting or bookkeeping mistakes that you see Amazon sellers make? Not having them. <laughs> that, that by far is the number one issue we see is just not having anything. And the number two issue we see is them only using seller board or inventory lab, and that's it. That's probably issue number two. Issue number three, if they even get another step and they're like, you know what, I'm going to try QuickBooks. And they try QuickBooks. There's all sorts of errors people typically make with QuickBooks. You know, I had, again, a colleague yesterday with another person, and they were trying QuickBooks on their own. They're like, oh, I think I'm good. And so I started asking some questions about the various things they were doing with it. And I was like, all right, I bet you're making this mistake, this mistake, this mistake. And yes, he was doing all of them. So the, the QuickBooks mistakes we usually see is people taking all the deposits to come in from Amazon and classifying them as sales. Not correct. Because keep in mind that that number is after all the deductions that Amazon has. So it's not actually sales. It's a support of that. So that's like problem number one we usually see. Uh, you know, as far as other bookkeeping mistakes, we, we generally see is just not keeping any sort of anything, basically. Even if you are entering in a seller board or inventory lab or just kind of entering your expenses in there, the challenge you see with that is that there's, there's basically no sort of, um, there's basically no sort of documentation. If you ever were to get audited, there's no trail. Like basically you're in there and saying, I spent $40 on Kiba this month. But there's nothing tracing that back to a credit card. So if you already audited, like you then would have to figure out, oh crap, where did I spend this? Like I go through five credit cards and figure out where this expense was. And then it makes your audit like terrible if you ever do get audited. And that's kind of part of the issue there. And so that's kind of like the biggest issue I tend to see is A, just not using bookkeeping at all and, and all those sorts of things. So hopefully it makes sense. It, absolutely. One, one of the follow-ups to that, because I know that uh, it especially seems on, on the arbitrage side, maybe not so much on wholesale and, and PL side, but arbitrage sellers tend to be a little bit more price sensitive. You know, we're looking for deals all the time. So what do you think is for a good bookkeeper, uh, accountant, uh, what do you think that cost should be on a monthly basis to take care of your books? I would say it would fully depend on a lot of different factors and like, well, we're pricing clients out for us. I'll tell you kind of how we, we think about it. 
and most accountants run the same way if we're doing, doing bookkeeping, that sort of thing. So generally the way we look at it is what sort of business model do you have? And if you're arbitrage, wholesale, or private label, there's a big difference between the three because OA sellers have tons of transactions we have to go through. Wholesale is a lot less transactions and then private label is significantly less transactions. So it's usually by like transaction level and the way we do it is usually by business model. Then when you factor that in, then you factor in kind of like the revenue level that we, that we generally have as well. So we have different brackets. So like from like zero to 200,000 a year, from 200 to 300,000, 300 to 500,000, 500 to eight, and then 800 to a million, and then a million to three, and we have all these different brackets. So generally the reason why we do that is again, to kind of get a generalized idea of how many transactions and how much stuff is going on in your business. So then we have how many credit cards you have, how many bank accounts you have, how many loans you have, all the stuff kind of like factors in what your pricing should be. I can tell you on average for most people who are probably going to listen to this, this episode, there are less than, let's say a million and a half. Generally, we're usually going to land somewhere. If you're kind of starting out like 250 a month, all the way up to six, 700 a month. Uh, and so you start getting, unless you, again, unless you're kind of an out, outlier where you're using like 25 credit cards or, which does happen. And that's it. I think the most I've seen is like 21, I think on the client. Uh, so it, it does happen, but those are kind of the things that would impact what those numbers would look like. So, and that's again, what's that's again with our team that actually knows e-commerce. We've seen a lot of like Philippine people and we've seen like people that, that don't know bookkeeping, they're charging like 150 a month or 200 for even larger sellers, but you're also getting very subpar bookkeeping in most cases. Good to know. Thank you. So, uh, uh, kind of following up on that theme, um, and I will probably mention this at, at the, the end of the show, uh, where people can follow you, but, uh, you are, you're a really good Twitter follow. Um, and some of my favorite threads are, uh, when you talk about myths. Um, mm -hmm. so I, I want to touch on that a little bit, tax and accounting myths. Um, there's a ton of them out there, um, about as many opinions, uh, in, in either direction, uh, in mm -hmm. all directions as well. Um, like for example, the big one that, that I kind of always enjoy, uh, reading about is, is cash back is tax free a hundred percent yeah. of the time. Um, can you talk about why that, uh, might be a myth <laughs> and yeah. then any, any other ones that, uh, that you want to yeah. entertain us with, I, I, I'm all game for. Yeah. I'll preface this on the reason why you get all these differing opinions is usually you get these differing opinions when there's no clear set documentation on a specific rule within what, whatever you're talking about, because there's a lot of the varying rules in the IRS guidelines. And if you don't know the way the IRS works is that everything you make is technically taxable, unless there's an exception to the rule. That's what it says. That's the reason why they can throw the book at someone who steals, who embezzles funds, uh, they can do tax evasion for embezzling because that embezzled money was technically taxable and no one ever claims it. So that's how they get you. And so. When you look at it from that perspective, that there has to be a specific exception to the rule in order for you not to claim it. So that boils down to, okay, well, they have all these specific rules and then you have interpretations of those rules. And that's where you get a lot of this gray area because it depends on how it's interpreted by whoever accountant you're working with. And there's various factors on why they would give you this information. I mean, there's people out there that have heard it from five different people and they're like, oh yeah, this sounds like a great idea. Um, and they're just trying to get like files on TikTok and things like that. Then you have other accounts that have a lot of clients and they, they have to basically be, they have to make sure that they're following the rules as best they possibly can. Because what a lot of people may not know is that if you get audited for a specific reason, let's say I'm going like very, very aggressive on something that we have no documentation for. We're just kind of like throwing out gusts of rules, all this other crap out there. And if we were to get audited, then it's it potentially puts a red flag on the entire operation for all of the other people that did tax returns underneath the operation. So if you work with someone who's super aggressive, you have to understand that they're likely aggressive with all of their other clients too, which opens up your risk, your risk of actually being audited higher than if you're going with someone who isn't necessarily as aggressive. And so that's kind of where you have to think about like from a logic perspective, like if I'm going to be severely aggressive on my taxes, I need to make sure I have a hundred percent clean documentation. So if I ever were to get audited, then I'm good to go. But if you're like, uh, I'm not very good at documentation, then you probably shouldn't be very aggressive because if you did get audited, you would be in trouble. And so I want to make sure I preface these myths based on that, because that's where a lot of these myths come from is they may be hearing something from a very, very aggressive accountant saying, oh yeah, you can do that and you could file it, 
But the question lies is, does it actually align with what the IRS expects you to do? Does it potentially put you in case for an audit? And that's, that's realistically what, what the problem here is. So talking about your specific question about cash back, now we kind of preface this, is we go back to that same general rule of is that everything is taxable unless there's a specific rule. There is no specific rule that specifically says cash back is not taxable. There just isn't one out there. The reason why you've seen a lot of this like random interpretation of this is because if you do a Google search and say, is, ta is cash back taxable? And so what will come up is they'll say, uh, it's considered a rebate. So it's not taxable. Now, yes, there is an IRS guideline that says rebates are not taxable. Same thing with, same thing with mileage. There's guidelines that I'm sorry, uh, credit card mileage, like some card points. There's been tax, uh, cases and studies where those have been defended and those are perfectly fine as not taxable. But the cash backs are really weird one because always sellers use cash back like very differently than a lot of other people do. Like, for example, let's say you're using Recute, right? A ton of OA sellers use Recute and they use these other sites too. I used to as well. So I'm very familiar with them. And the way that you're doing it when you're a consumer, let's say I'm a consumer and I'm just using Recute and they get cash back off. Let's say I buy something for a hundred bucks, I'm getting 6% back, so I get $6 back. And when you do that search on Google, it's telling it's not taxable. And that's right, because as a consumer, you do not get taxed on stuff you buy like that. And obviously you charge sales tax, but you don't get charged income tax on stuff you buy. So that's logical. That makes sense because it's not that taxable income. It's just not. Now, when you put it into a business context, it flips it a little bit, because if you think about logically, when you buy something, you do what? You put in cost of goods sold, right? That's where you're typically doing it. It's an expense. And then when you get that cash back, what is, that's a rebate, right? But it's a rebate against the amount that you pay, which you pay under cost of goods sold. So logically, it makes sense that all it's doing is just offsetting your cost of goods sold, which means that, yes, it's technically taxable if it's in your business because of the fact that it drops your cost of goods sold. It, it directly, it's not taxable. Like you just say, well, is the income taxable? No. Well, it's just lower my cost of goods sold, which inherently makes it taxable. So that, that's realistically kind of the, the, the philosophy we, we use on this. Now, a key thing to keep in mind is that if you just deposit into your, into your personal checking account and the, and the accountant doesn't know about it, it is what it is. Technically, yes, it's taxable. Is anyone going to find out that it's there? Unlikely. And the reason why is because the IRS doesn't get 1099 or any sort of documentation from uh, from the cash back company saying how much you got. So that's why we see a lot of sellers just deposit their accounts and just poof, it's gone. Whether that's legal or not, different story. But the, the risk level of doing that as a seller is extremely low, which is the reason why a lot of them do it. Like in, in our instance, if you're working with us and there actually is cash back put into your account, into your business account, we have no option other than to claim it as, as cost of goods sold because that's what it is. Like there's no guideline that tells you different. And so that's kind of the reason why the, like we total the line on that, where if it's in business, it's taxable. If it's not in the business, we just don't know about it. Um, so that's kind of like one minute, but I'll throw a couple more out there really, really quickly. Cause I know we don't want like the labor on this topic, but, um, S corps are a good idea all the time was a, is a myth that we see a lot. And I kind of debunked that a little bit ago. Again, like I said, I had a guy yesterday saying they're, they're counting, want to do it right away. And we did the math yesterday. I was on the call with him and he actually ended up spending $1,500 more by moving over to an S corp because he did it too early. And the problem with that is you can't just flip back. You have to wait five years before you can change to another back and forth. So if you want to like, stop you have to wait. And so. That's part of the challenge is that if you do that, you're stuck with it for five years. So you want to make sure you're going to be profitable and profitable at 50 grand a year moving forward if you're going to make that switch. Um, another one that you see a lot, especially on TikTok, is I just ran off my G-Wagon. <laughs> That's our fun one. And yes, theoretically, you can write off your G-Wagon. Theoretically, you can. But again, it's supposed to be for a business purpose. So like RE sellers, those are people that probably could legitimately do a G-Wagon because they're probably out there sourcing and need the big vehicle to code everything. So it logically makes sense. However, that OA guy who sits at their desk the entire day, how can you justify that as a business expense, really? 
Yep. Yeah, think about laws. If you get audited, like, how would you be able to say, oh, yeah, I sit in front of my computer all day as a job. I never go anywhere, but somehow I need a vehicle that for business. It's not logical. And so that's kind of the way you have to think about it from an IRS perspective is like, if you ever had to defend this, how would you defend it? And you would look at it and be like, uh, I can't defend that. Well, that's probably not a good idea. So, so okay. Okay. What, I'm, what I'm hearing is that it, it's better for OA uh, online arbitrage sellers to buy like Gucci slippers and stuff because that's easy, oh, of course, easier to defend, right? Of course, of course. <laughs> they need the slippers. <laughs> yeah. No, see, so we're settling for Air Monarchs when we could have such better footwear. So, obviously, <laughs> obviously that's, that's, that's the key. This is right off of the uniform expense. Um, I'll throw that one out there too, because I actually had this question on Twitter actually yesterday. I think it was early this morning or something I answered on it. And someone asked me, uh, you know, can I, can I take some sneakers and, uh, they, they didn't want to resell because they didn't go well this, you know, write it off as a uniform expense. Well, again, you have to think about documentation here. And that's an area that like is, it's heavily looked at, especially if you're like, no, Hey, if you have no employees, like if you have no employees and you don't do any travel to in front of people, like why would you need a uniform? You don't. But again, if you're like, okay, well, my people do need a uniform because maybe I'm on calls like this. Then why have my next full logo on every call that I do with, with potential wholesale suppliers? And so what you generally would do for documentation on this is you would create an employee handbook and you would say a portion of the employee handbook would say uniform and say exactly what it is. And then make sure that what you're buying aligns with exactly what the uniform policy says and don't deviate from it. That doesn't mean that like you put in the uniform policy that says you have to have a polo shirt with you know, embroidery here of, of, uh, of your company name, you're allowed to wear, you know, tennis shoes, things like that, but the tennis shoes realistically are part of the uniform, <laughs> you know? So you have to think, think through, like, if you were again, having to defend yourself on this, how would you do it? And you have to have logic behind it. And, you know, if you were to get audited and you have a handbook showing this and this is what it was, you can see, we bought this from here. And then we also had it embroidered. It makes logical sense. You have a, a path that shows that, yes, this actually was used in a business context. If you're buying a dress to go to an Amazon event, probably not going to be able to, uh, you know, write that off. It's probably a one time thing. And you're like, oh yeah, I had to get this. I had to get this because, uh, I was going to speak at a conference, which maybe, but again, that's one of those cases where you'd have to really figure out how would you defend us? That was the case. Interesting. I, I like, I, I really like what you're. I don't know what you've said this a few times. How do I defend against it? And I think, I don't know if you think logically about a lot of tax questions that come up, you could probably figure that out and just spend a few minutes really thinking about that. I, I, it's a good framework to take away from this whole podcast, in my opinion. How would you defend it? I mean, it's like when people ask us questions and they'll, they're very like borderline, right? Is we could, obviously we could ask this stuff a lot. Like, how do you do this? How do you do that? And because I write this off. Um, you know, if it's, if, if it's hundred percent in your business, makes a lot of sense. It's part of it. Really no questions asked on that. Like your software services, your, uh, expenses for Amazon, like all of that, very easy to write off, but it's all these like edge cases that we get asked about and they're like, well, can we write this off? Can we write that off? And the answer always is how would you defend it if you got audited? Like what logical business sense do you have for this purpose? And that's, uh, if they have none, that is probably not able to write off. If you become a logical reason for it and you have some sort of documentation to back that up or some sort of like reason you could show to an IRS agent, then okay, you'll probably find that. Huh. All right. Now I've got, I've got one more. I know we're kind of harping on this, but I've got one more that I would like you to, uh, you, you know, fact check for me. Sure. Uh, and this one kind of, yeah, this one irritates me because I see it. I, I don't see it too often, but I see it enough and it, I, I think it's bad advice. Uh, but I will see a lot of sellers say that, oh, well, you're buying shipping boxes, uh, and you can go ahead and, and use your tax exempt for that. Uh, that is not true. Is that correct? Correct. That's what I That's thought. Correct. Uh, the only way that that would align properly is if you're a manufacturer of products and it's physically part of the actual products. Let's say you're, you're making a microwave. And you'd have to have styrofoam in a box to house the microwave and then you're signing off overseas or to whoever to resell it. And the outside of the box has your brand of packaging, blah, blah. That potentially can make sense. Um, 
you know, if you look at it from like, let's say a bundle perspective, that one's a little more borderline because if you have a branded box and like, that's the way you're actually selling it is directly in that box, then maybe you have a little bit of a borderline case for those instances, but you know, realistically for a standard OA client, absolutely not. Perfect. I, I that's going to be the headline in my opinion, because I see that too often. Um, now let's, let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about, uh, how should Amazon sellers specifically wholesale and arbitrage sellers, how should they approach accounting and tax planning differently than maybe your more traditional business, uh, an insurance agency, uh, an architect office or something like that. Yeah. I mean, when you think about the traditional stuff, a lot of people are thinking about like, um, like a nail salon or like a, a small restaurant places like that, like mom and pop type shops. And from a bookkeeping perspective, those businesses are very, very simple. It's like cashing cash out. That's basically about it. Uh, the big difference between e-commerce in a lot of these other industries is they're just, they're just so capital intensive and there's just so many moving parts specifically in businesses that are there on Amazon, which is, I'm guessing probably 90 to 95% of the people listening to this. There's just so many moving parts with Amazon that you have to keep track of all of them. Like, for example, you have to keep track of how many, how many fees you have for all the various expenses that come through for Amazon. You have to keep track of your inventory storage charges. You got to keep track of, uh, missing inventory that disappears when it gets to Amazon, you open tickets and then potentially write it off. You got cases where if you do an OA order, you double order something and uh, you maybe don't double order something, but you order something that just never shows up or you get double charged for that. Like there's all these various things that are just like random accounting issues that it just kind of like poof money disappears that you don't see in, in those other types of businesses, which is the reason why the e-commerce accounting is very, very difficult when you compare it to other industries. Like we have. We have a lot of clients in our, our franchise tax offices that are small businesses. They're, you know, just like I said, nail salons, they're little pound store, bottom pound retail shops, real estate investors, you got all these different people that, that work with us and their books are simple. Their books are very, very simple. It's cash in, cash out. E-commerce is like a totally different ballgame. Uh, and so that's kind of like the, the, the big difference I see there. A couple other things to kind of think about too, is your bookkeeping should always be an accrual method. Now, uh, repeat that one more time. It should always be an accrual method. If you're unfamiliar with what accrual versus cash is, I'll give you a very, very quick primer. When you're looking at it specifically from an inventory perspective, the way cash works is that the moment you buy the stuff, it's immediately written off as cost of goods sold, which is what we do. When people do their own books, they almost always do that. The way you should be doing it is you put it into an inventory asset and then when items sell, then you move it over to cost of goods sold, which is the accrual method. And the reason why is because if you're trying to actually make any sort of decisions off of your books, they're worthless if you're doing cash. Because you could buy, let's say, $100,000 of inventory and only sell through 80000 of that inventory and your profit margins, you know, 10%. So you actually made, let's say, you know, $10,000, but you got $20,000 in inventory. If you do cash, it'll show you as negative $10,000 in profit. If you do an accrual, it'll show you positive $10,000 in profit. And if you're trying to make business decisions, okay, well, I actually make money that I like, what do I need to change my buying decisions? Like that sort of thing. It totally gets thrown off if you're doing cash because you just can't make those decisions. Because if you're thinking you're losing $10,000, like, oh crap. But then I look at inventory lab and inventory lab tells me I'm making $8,000. What's right? I don't know. And so that, that's what we see a lot of is that we see people doing cash in their bugs or just not having it at all and nothing aligns properly. And if you're doing cash for tax purposes, that's okay. Still keep your books in accrual and have your accountant actually do calculations to figure out what it would be in cash method for taxes. And you can do that. But realistically, your, your goal should be is to be able to make your, your decisions in your business based off true financials, which can only be done in accrual method in an e-commerce business. So that's kind of one of our big takeaways I would see here is because I see a ton of people when they're doing their own books, they almost always do it in cash and it makes the books useless. Now, if you use it just for taxes, okay, it's fine. But if you want to make any sort of decisions off of it, totally worthless. So interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned how important capital is in, in this business. So, um, I'd love to get from your perspective, uh, if you have any cash flow management 
best practices or tips for us sellers? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if we go back to that cash conversion cycle we talked about earlier, if you think about the various inputs here, how you impact those numbers is how you improve your fast flow. So examples of that would be, how do I, how do I expand the amount of time I need to pay? So like with a private label seller, anytime you can eke out an additional 15 to 20 days to make the payment to your supplier, or if you can somehow hold off your freight forwarding for 30 days for payment. Uh, if you have a wholesale supplier and you can somehow uh, hang out, you know, 30 to 60 days makes a big difference. Like I'll give you an example from back in, back in the day, uh, when I was selling Halloween costumes in the industry, when you were buying, I was buying all wholesale and in that industry, they had something called net November 10th terms. And what that meant is that you would place your orders prior to, prior to the Halloween season and you would not actually have to pay for your costumes until November 10th after Halloween. Amazing for cash flow purposes. Absolutely amazing because if you look at that from a cash, cash conversion cycle number, it's basically negative because you, you, you'll have to pay for it until you sell it. And so like, that's kind of actually what got me into that problems with that business because I was like, I, thought, I was looking at this free money. I'm like, oh, they're handing me money for free. Basically I'll just keep pushing the envelope, see how big of a line of credit they'll give me. And you know, like the, the largest cash supplier at one point gave me over a million dollars in a season. And, um, you know, I was I kept pushing the envelope every year. I was just submit POs and see if they get approved. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's kind of like, that's kind of like an example of how that cash conversion cycle can make a big difference. And so when you look at it from a cash flow perspective, you all look at all angles. So like that's one angle, which is paying your people. Next angle is, okay, how do I turn the inventory faster? Do I buy a seller fa uh, faster moving stuff that churns the cash quicker? You kind of like think about ways you can, you can help your cash flow. So those are kind of like the various things on the Amazon side of things. Like when you look at like, how do we compress the amount of time before we actually get the payment? Really nothing you can do on Amazon. They're just, you know, that's just how it is. The other option would be is to sell on platforms that don't have that holding period, like Shopify or sign locally. Like those are a couple other ways that you can sell things. eBay, I think is another one too, that doesn't really have a, a huge, uh, reserve balance type issue. So. Those are places that, that you're, that you're, that you can kind of churn down the amount of time that takes to convert cash over cash. Now, once you have an idea as far as how to affect that, that's a matter of tracking it. And what we strongly recommend for anyone is that it's effectively called the cash flow projections. Now in big businesses, they're typically doing, you know, 12 to 18 week cash flow projection, if not further out. And what they're basically doing is you're at minimum. And some, you know, bigger businesses have huge software tools doing this for them. But if you look at this just from like a, a smaller arbitrage seller standpoint, what you basically do is you create a spreadsheet and you basically break out by week. So you say, you know, week one, week two, week three, and you kind of break it out. And you look at, okay, what are my credit card payments do? All right. So you pop the credit card payments due into, into the spreadsheet and when they will be due. So you have to make the payments. So you know, cash is coming out for that. Then you take a look at, okay, well, where else will money be coming out of my account and when will it be coming out? And it's kind of like projecting what that looks like into the next like three months. And you plop them out on almost a timeline down the spreadsheet. And at the top, you then project, all right, well, when I get my payments from Amazon, that's the one that's a lot more difficult to figure out because <laughs> it's based on the roller coaster sales. It's based on, uh, you know, it's based on the reserves you're holding. So a lot of cases of we're trying to figure it out, it's mostly just trying to get averages of what's happened in the past based on sales. So. If we know that sales were X and our payouts were Y, what percent of the number is that? So is it, you know, 40% of the payout, whatever it is, we just kind of plug those numbers in based on what we expect our sales to be. And then then plug in how much we actually have in cash. And then once you kind of plug all this in, you should be able to look at the spreadsheet and see where your cash is going to be over the next 12 weeks. And if you see some negative numbers there, you got a problem. All right. So then you have to figure out, okay, well, do I need to turn inventory faster? Do I need to get more uh, money from loans? Am I going to let money sit on a credit card? Uh, that's kind of where you start thinking about those various things. But generally what a lot of sellers generally do is they don't do this and they look at their bank account and they're like, oh crap, I got to make credit card payments due in two days. So they make the credit card payment. Now their bank account's down to zero dollars. And then they're looking at their payments again. And they're like, oh crap, I have another payment. I got to wait for this Amazon payment. 
you know, this is exactly how a lot of people operate personally. If we think about it from a financial perspective on personal financials, that's how the majority of Americans operate. They look at their bank account, bills are due, bills go out. They have $5 left in their account until the next paycheck. It's basically the same method of methodology. And if you want to get out of that trap, you have to actually have that sort of planning. Interesting. Um, I'm going to, I want to veer off track for one second, uh, because you did, you brought up your, your Halloween costume business again, and I'm just curious. Yeah. I know you said that you, know, you have the net November terms is, is what hurt that business returns? Is that what ended up causing the, the issues mostly? Um, it was a part of it. I mean, it wasn't the whole reason yeah. that specific year was just a, a, a bunch of paper cut problems that just added up to a massive colossal failure. Um, you know, the one issue that we saw, which I think I actually responded to, I don't know if it was one of your tweets or not, but, um, when there's multiple ASINs for the same product, right. And we see it, mm-hmm. we, we used to see this a ton back in the day. It's probably still happening out there today where you'll see like the same exact product is just under these three different ASINs and Amazon might be selling on one, but not the other two. So you would source and fulfill the other two, which still have a decent amount of volume and you're selling through a bunch. And so we, we abused that strategy left and right with the costume business because Amazon would, uh, would be on most of our listings. So we, it was hard to compete against them, but there's always these secondary listings that we can, we could sell on. And so we're buying items in January to sell in October. Keep in mind, it's for 10 months, not knowing what the heck's going to happen. So we're buying all of this stuff in January and then in September right before Halloween, like really starts hitting systematically, Amazon starts combining every single listing we stocked hard on. And so all of those items we had to just dump at a loss, we had to dump them at a loss or we couldn't sell through them. And so we had all that inventory problem there. Then this also happened to be a specific year where when you're buying in January, you don't really know what's going to be hot for, for Halloween. You really have no clue. So you're kind of just guessing based on historical patterns and historical patterns in the Halloween industry. Any movies that came out during the summer that did well, generally do extremely well uh, during Halloween, especially if they're like franchise, like superheroes, Batman, things like that. So what would happen is that they would basically have these presentations and say, all right, well, here's all the movies coming out this summer. Uh, here's, all, here's the age ranges for these people. Here's the characters we think they're going to do well. And they're basically giving you all this information. You kind of have to take it either with a grain of salt or just follow the recommendation. And that's where the buying really like came into play. And then you have to figure out, okay, well, if this particular character is in a movie that's designed for, let's say 10 year olds, all right, well, what sizes do you need? How many smalls do you need? How many mediums do you need? It's, it was very, very difficult to figure all this stuff out. So we put in all these orders, obviously in January, a bunch of movies flopped that they expected. And then there also was another movie that got pushed back and was not released until after Halloween. And so we bought heavy on all this stuff and it's got stuck with all this inventory at the end of the season. So I have basically no cash in the end of the season to pay the bill, but all this inventory and, uh, and the margins were just you know, trash because of Amazon. We combined all this stuff and I was looking at the numbers and I'm like, we're not going to make it till next Halloween season. So then we had to figure out a plan and how to basically collapse the business. So we went through a whole deal to, uh, you know, pay off suppliers as best we could. Um, we had not claimed bankruptcy, but we went through, uh, we went through basically working out deals, taking back some suppliers, took back inventory. Um, it was a lot of negotiations and we finally had to get out of it and then we restarted the business, uh, you know, a year later. Nice. Yeah, that, I, I would imagine. I would imagine eventually I'd love to deep dive that way because there's probably a lot of things to learn. Uh, yeah, it may not be the, the most fun to, to recall, but I'm sure there's a lot of things people could take away from that. Um, now going back, you said that people should be using the accrual method, uh, and because that'll help you make some decisions. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are some key financial metrics that Amazon sellers should be tracking or looking at to be able to make those decisions? Good question. And a lot of it boils down to contribution margin. Uh, if no one's ever heard of this term of contribution margin, effectively what it is is anything that's variable within your business that's associated with the sales that you do. 
So generally that would be like your prep fees, your cost of goods sold, your econ platform fees, any ad spend you would have. You kind of combine all those numbers and that gives you a contribution margin number. And that's pretty much the big number that tells you whether you're going to be profitable or not. And like what we typically see, like, for example, like cost of goods sold as a percentage of sales. When we're looking at it from an OA perspective, we tend to see a lot of sellers stick somewhere between 50 to 60% as we generally see for OA. Like we have some sellers below 50, which those are the ones that are heavily profitable. But if you're between that 50 and 60, which is the majority of OA sellers, you're lucky if you're profitable. You're, you're teetering on it. And the reason why is because if you think out from a percentage basis, right, you only have a hundred percent, right? And you have to include all of your expenses. You have to include uh, Amazon fees. You got to include your profit, uh, your, any payroll, stuff like that. You got to include all of that hundred percent. And if you're starting out, out the bat with your cost of goods sold, let's say it's 60%. Then your Amazon fees, which in a lot of cases for most sellers range anywhere from 30 to 34 percent. If you're selling a lot of low dollar amount items, it jumps up even higher. If you're selling higher dollar amount items, it gets lower. So we see some holding sellers and some larger sellers, uh, especially if you're in the, uh, in like electronics, because electronics only have the 8% commission versus 15. Uh, those tend to be closer to like 27%. But let's just say, for example, you're a regular OA seller. That's a 33%. They are 50, 60% for cost of goods sold, 33% for Amazon fees. You do the math there. What do you got left? 7%. And so you got 7% now to handle your profit and all of your expenses, which means your VAs, your prep center, your everything, literally everything. And it's just not profitable. And so that's the reason why we see a lot of OA sellers are trying to push that number like 60%. It's just, we see a, a ton of stuff. And obviously every returns too, to factor into this, a return mm -hmm. loss. So just looking at each of those metrics and figuring out what that is as a cost per, a cost uh, percent of sales. We, we do this every month for our clients, uh, on the, uh, on that side. So we calculate these things and tell them what the numbers are. And the ones that are closer to 50% for OA and uh, any type of arbitrage, let me even wholesale the same way. They're very, very similar. The closer you are to 50% or less, the higher of a chance you have for profitability. If you're above 50%, it becomes more dicey. If you start pushing above 55 up to 60, it's highly unlikely you're going to be profitable unless you're selling very high dollar amount items or if you are selling something in a category that has less commission fees. That's pretty much all about too. So. That's kind of like, that's kind of like number one we like to look at. Another one we like to look at is like turnover percentage, which is basically how quick do you turn over inventory, which then goes back into the cash conversion cycle we talked about earlier. Because the best sellers we see that are again, wholesale OA kind of sellers, I know it's most of your audience kind of falls into this. So I'm focusing most of my answers to this is usually about 70% per month. So they're selling through about 70% of your inventory per month. That's good. That's really, really good. We see some sellers closer to 50 or 40%, which effectively means that they're only selling through their inventory like half of it per month. Mm -hmm. And what you should be doing is tracking this on a month-to-month -month basis. And you should be trying to improve it as best you can. Now, keep in mind that like the lower the number is, the more cash you have to have to operate things. But again, talking about the cash conversion cycle. Because, you know, like a, like a, uh, a 50% turnover rate means it's, it takes you two months to sell through stuff. That makes sense. Cause like 30 days, 50% times two makes it 60 days. So you kind of like calculate it out. That's one of the numbers we like to look at too. Um, another one would be return on invested capital. And we like to look at this at an annualized rate. And basically what this is, is it's a very simple number. You're basically taking whatever your profit was and dividing it by what your average inventory level is. And the reason why we do this is because we assume that you're investing money into inventory. And so by doing calculation, it gives you effectively like a, a true like return on your capital that you're putting into the business. Now, obviously, there are factors of working capital you need into the business. But it's a very rough number to look at. If you really want to get to the nitty gritty, you can say, okay, well, how much do I actually like generally need for operating costs and kind of add that into the number if you want. Mm -hmm. Now, a very, very simple number is again, just profit divided by inventory. And it gives you a very good number to look at. The way you would use this number was number one, if you're trying to take on debt, take on loans and you're wanting to pay interest rates. If we look at your ROIC, it's annualized. And let's say your ROIC is 
only at 11%, which is extremely low, by the way, way, way low. And then you look at your loan and they're like, well, 0.99%. That effectively would mean if you took on that debt, you'll be losing money every single time you bought some. Is what that would look like because it's less than the ROIC number. Um, and so it's a good, that's a very, uh, very good calculation to look at. Another way of looking at it is looking at that number versus what you would use. If you had that money and put it into something else, what would you make with it? Like in the stock market, uh, the average is what, 8, 10% per year. So if you're looking at your ROIC and it's only like 7%, then why the hell are you even running this business in the first place? You know, and so those are, those are kind of like some things you can kind of look at with that number. Um, okay. It, on, when it comes to ROIC, what, uh, what kind of numbers are you seeing from like your superstar clients? Over hundred percent. Over hundred percent. Okay. That's fantastic. I would say, I would say it normalizes probably between 40 and 60%, but, um, again, it, it really depends on how quick you're turning inventory. Like if you're turning inventory over super, super quick, your ROIC is going to be significantly better. Um, and all these numbers kind of just like, they're all intertwined together. Like when you kind of look at all these various things and like one lever affects another number and then one other thing affects another number. And, and it, once you start looking at all these, all these variables, you can see how they kind of just like you move one thing and it affects this and affects this. And that's those type of things you should be looking at as a business owner, especially when you're looking at your financials at the end of the month. Um, and if you're just running on like even for a lever solid board, you have none of this stuff. Um, so that's why like having adequate financials, uh, make a lot of sense if you want to become a actual true business owner. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, so is there uh as far as like tax laws and whatnot, uh, you obviously have to keep up on, on changes that are, that are coming down, down the road. Is there any, uh, any changes, any tax law changes that we should be aware of or anything that's coming? The only one that would impact most people there's, but we want the cool thing for with our franchise side of things is they give us this whole tax presentation about all the various tax law changes and stuff like that. And then they sit. They run all these variables to say how many people are likely going to be impacted by these various changes. And you know, when, when they sent us those, those numbers, it impacted a very, very minimal amount of people. So realistically, there's very minimal tax changes that will really impact anyone really, with the exception of what just popped in within the last week. Uh, and the one that popped in the last week, which I'm guessing is probably what triggered this question is the 1099 Ks. Um, if you may or may not know, there was a law change two years ago now where the threshold for getting 1099 Ks from payment providers, which would be like Amazon, Stripe, uh, all these various places that send you money, eBay, um, that they send you a 1099 K at the end of the year, it used to be $20,000 or 200 transactions. Is what the number has been for decades, it's been like that for a long time. Well, two years ago, they changed it to 600 bucks and there's been mass media attention around this because People are like, oh crap, what about my money I'm sending through Venmo to my friend that paid for pizza last night? You know, and it might add up to over $600 in a year if we do this. And so there's a lot of like rhetoric around this and a lot of uh, uproar with, you know, media and things like that. So last year, December 23rd, you know, seven, eight days before the end of the year, they decided to push it back a year to this year. And so, okay, cool. We got to reframe last year. So this year we're like, all right, we're going to do it this year, $600. And then when the last week they came out with another delay. <laughs> so it's back again to the old rule. Um, the key thing to keep in mind here is that theoretically it shouldn't change your, what you would do with taxes anyways, because even if you don't get a 1099, you're still required to, to pay taxes on the money you made. If you sell on eBay, let's say you sold like $8,000 on eBay and you don't get a 1099K, it doesn't mean it's free money. You're still supposed to claim that on your taxes, even if you never got a 1099K. The 1099 K is just a document to get sent to the IRS to verify for sure what you actually had. And, uh, and that's, that's kind of really the only deal. So theoretically from a tax perspective, yes, you should not be paying anything different in taxes. You should have been claiming this stuff anyways. It just makes it again, this year, slightly easier to hide. If you do only make eight to you know, say $15,000 in sales, theoretically you could hide it if you wanted to, it's not legal to do it, but you could because the IRS has no idea this money ever. Um, so that's kind of the big tax tax law change that you're just not going to get 1099 to meet under 20 grand on the platform. 
uh, unless the platform already made internal changes to do this, which we didn't see this last year. So I have to assume they're not going to do it this year either, but who knows? You know, they're, they're, they're just not legally, so they don't legally have to do it. They can do it if they want to, which is another compliance piece. It's just costing money to do. So why would they do it? So, mm-hmm. right. uh, December is right around the corner. Uh, are there any end of the year tasks that uh, Amazon sellers should add to their to-do list, uh, just to make sure they're ready for tax season? Yeah. So that the absolutely number one thing that you should be doing before the end of the year is some sort of physical inventory valuation. And what that basically is, is figuring out where all of your inventory is at and doing a calculation. You should be doing this as of December 31st. It's not like you have to do it on December 31st. You just have to make sure that whatever report you're able to pull to be pulled as of, as of December 31st. And so the areas you should be looking at is, okay, uh, how much money is saying Amazon? Usually inventory labs, seller board do, do a pretty good job of giving you that. Then you go back in time, pull that if you need to. But it's all the other stuff that you need to calculate. So like, uh, do you have stuff sitting at a prep center that has not been shipped yet? A lot of prep centers just don't keep track of your inventory for you in their building. They usually don't. And so you should be asking your prep center, all right, how much inventory do I have as of, as of the 31st? Or give me some sort of list of what's physically there. Um, so that should be a, a, a check. Take a look at your death piles. You know, people have death piles in the garages, wherever. You should, you should be figuring out all of your, all of your returns and figuring out what sort of value you want to apply to that inventory that's still there. It's in the death pile. Uh, you should also be figuring out, okay, this is particular. If you're doing actual, like straight up bookkeeping, like, like with us, where, uh, where you've paid for on the credit card that's showing up in the books because you paid for on the credit card, but maybe you just haven't received it yet. So those are cases where you want to calculate those as well. Now, if you're not doing like legit bookkeeping or just running through inventory lab. That's a step you'll have to worry about because it doesn't show up anyways, but that's just something to kind of keep in mind when you're looking at, at that. So it's pretty much just thinking about where's all my inventory at probably with that number. And then that particular number is what will be used on the taxes to determine what your cost of goods sold is for years. So that's a very big number to know. If you don't run that valuation, then you're pretty much just running off of whatever inventory lab shows or whatever your bookkeeping software shows, which means that especially if you're running ad- accurate bookkeeping, it likely means that you're going to be missing out on the write off because there's almost always inventory missing in some fashion that should be written off. And if you don't find out how much that is, it just never gets written off until you figure that out. So you want to get that right off this year. So by doing that physical inventory evaluation, it allows you to make sure you find whatever that lost inventory number is in appropriate right, right off this year. So that should be by far the number one thing you should be doing before the end of the year. Um, other than that, just make sure you're starting to, to put together all of your various expenses, uh, make sure you have your documentation prepared for your, for your tax returns. Um, you know, it's really about that. There's not a whole lot you really have to do at the end of the year. It's mostly just getting prepared for tax tax season. Uh, it's mostly it, which you know, everyone does every single year. And if you're new right. to it, it's mostly just getting your documentation ready. We have a uh, a business tax worksheet on our website that if you're just like totally clueless, you have no idea, like you track nothing the entire year. We have a, a worksheet on our website, uh, tomlocalvisors.com, where you can go on there. Uh, it's just right on like, the resource link. And uh, it's a worksheet you can download. And you can basically take your stuff from your credit card statements, bank statements, and pop it in there, and it'll calculate all your expenses for you throughout the year. Uh, so it kind of helps you get ready for taxes. So if you're literally cool to have no idea, that could be a good first step is kind of grab that. That's free. It doesn't cost anything to get it. So it's just, we have it available on our website to grab. And um, so that's kind of, that's kind of about it. Nice. How do you uh, say, how do you account for, say, spouses and children uh, uh, who, take significant five finger discounts from your inventory. Is there a, where does that fit on the, uh, the balance sheet? Um, uh-huh. but, uh, <laughs> oh, no, those I'm... would technically be all drawn us is what those would be. So you would just move like, oh, for example, if you had them in inventory, you move from inventory to ours draws is what you would move us. Yeah. All right. It's not right, so that, that just means I'm going to start locking more doors. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so we've kind of shown a spotlight on a lot of things uh in this episode so um i'm getting very dry probably episode, just... sorry extremely dry yeah. episode really sorry no it's there's a lot to it you know it, it's um 
they, it's a lot more than just, you know, pulling a couple of reports on the inventory lab or, or something like that. So, mm-hmm. um, I'm guessing there are a lot of people out there that, that are maybe thinking they might need to take this more seriously. So, uh, considering that, um, when you're looking for an accountant, uh, for the upcoming tax season, um, what should Amazon sellers be looking for? What, what's some helpful advice? Yeah. So I would say that the number one thing you should be asking, number one, just don't randomly just go to like your friend's accountant and just think they're going to do a good job for you. That's kind of like number one. Ask them some questions. In particular, you should be asking them, how many other e-commerce clients do you have? Like how many have you done? Because a lot of like mom and pop CPAs will tell you they can do it, but they don't actually know how to do it. And we've seen a lot of cases where, which we got people come to us who use their local CPAs, which great people, they know taxes, they still know e-commerce. And like this year, we actually had uh, a few clients came to us. We looked over taxes and they were done properly. Uh, we had one particular person in instance where we saved them $13,000 in taxes because they actually pay, overpaid $13,000 in taxes last year because they used an accountant that didn't know how to do it properly. And so like, that's question one, like, how do you actually know e-commerce? Number two, you can say, okay, well, I use retail arbitrage or I do online arbitrage. Do you know what that means? And if you're like, uh, no, then they probably don't have a clue. Uh, if you get the answer out and then you're like, okay, well, what I do is I buy stuff from uh, Kohl's that I resell on Amazon. They're like, is that legal? You know, I'm sure you've seen this before. So, you know, those are, those are some of the questions you can ask them. Uh, you can also ask them some of the other questions that you would typically ask a CPA or, or an account that's, uh, that aligns with this. Like you can ask some questions you've asked me today. Like what is, uh, you know, like what, what's your stance on what you should use for Kohl's cash? You know, it's another question we answered out today, but the general answer should be use our personal version. This is what you should be doing. Today. And they have a whole thread on that too, but, um, that's what you should be doing. And, um, if you're not, then it's tax, uh, it's in your business is taxable. Um, you know, just ask for like very, very random things that you think that they should know that they just don't, that they're likely not going to know. If they don't give you answers, they don't give you, they don't understand what you're talking about. They're likely not the right person uh, for you. So that's more or less what it is. Just have their understanding of how do they understand your business? And if they don't, they're not the right person for you. Those are good tips. So I know we're, we're, we're coming up to a, a hard stop. We've, we've all got some, some things to do this afternoon, but. Uh, we always like to end the show with uh, a bit of a quote and, it, uh, this one I thought was appropriate because, uh, the world just lost what I consider to be probably, uh, one of the best business minds and, and thinkers that, uh, we've ever seen, uh, and probably the best creator of aphorisms, this side of Benjamin Franklin, uh, it's Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger passed away yesterday. Uh, the, uh, I believe yesterday was the 27th or the 28th, sorry, he passed away on the 28th, uh, 99 years old. Uh, and this quote kind of encapsulates, uh, I think why we started this podcast. Um, it's all about learning. So Charlie Munger said, if you're going to live a long time, you have to keep learning. What you formerly knew is not enough. If you don't adapt, you're like a one-legged man in an ass kicking contest. Uh, and, uh, I thought that was a, that's, one of his great quotes, if you don't have the book, the Tao of Charlie Munger, I would highly suggest you go and grab it. It's a fantastic book, just full of, uh, witticisms that he's come up with, uh, over his long life. So, uh, that's the show, Chris, uh, Chris Potter. Thanks for being here, man. I appreciate you. And, uh, where can people go and, and find you and, and, and find out more about what you do for Amazon and e-commerce sellers? Certainly. Uh, you know, if you're looking for help this upcoming tax season, we are doing an offer throughout the rest of this year of 2023, where if you actually sign up with us for taxes before January 3rd, you'll get $250 off your taxes this year. And so if you're wanting to work with us and you're wanting us to help you with that, just go to tallocadvisors.com slash clear the shelf. And we'll have a little page there. There's also a, a, there's also a, a link there to, to download it. AI. Uh, an ebook that tells you about the seven uh, most deadly things you usually will have that will crush your your profitability. Uh, also, if you're uh, if you're just looking for a random questions, you can schedule a strategy session. Uh, there's a calendar on there you can schedule that. Uh, also, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Chris Potter three six one. And I, I tend to post uh, you know multiple times per week on there with all sorts of of random stuff. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I know that you said this episode was dry, but I learned a ton and. 
uh, I think that's, uh, that's way more important, uh, whether or not people may not, may not think this is the, the most fun episode to listen to. So I appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us, man. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Clear the Shelf with Chris and Chris. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a screenshot on your phone and share to Facebook, Instagram, or your favorite FBA group. And be sure to tag me and let me know why you liked it and what you'd like to hear more from us in the future. Also, I'd like to give you some free gifts for listening. Head over to rabbittrailchallenge.com and repricerchallenge.com for some free courses to further your business. Thanks for listening.